Number one, if you're going to treat people like criminals, they're going to act that way. If you treat people like they're disabled, they're going to act that way. If you treat people like people and you focus on their strengths, they're going to rise to the occasion. So I learned that early, early on. This episode is sponsored by Classical Conversations. Since 1997, Classical Conversations has been equipping families like yours with the resources to homeschool with confidence following a classical curriculum rooted in a Christ-centered worldview alongside other families in a local community. Homeschooling is doable with Classical Conversations. Check out classicalconversations.com forward slash Gibbons for more information. Again, that's classicalconversations.com forward slash Gibbons, G-I-B-B-E-N-S. EQ Gangsters, thank you so much for joining us today. Super excited to have our guest today, Jonathan Liebert. Um, I had an opportunity to meet Jonathan at an event called PRISM, which was recognizing social entrepreneurship in the Colorado Springs area. Jonathan is the founder, and I'm going to let him kind of go into his background and stuff. I was invited by a great buddy of mine, the founder of a company called Veteran PCS, who is a guy named Jason Anderson, and he recommended me to attend PRISM. And it was an amazing, amazing, amazing experience. A lot of my audience are entrepreneurs. And so, Jonathan, you know, you have, you have, you work very, very, uh, you know, you're very integrated and intimately involved with, with many, many entrepreneurs. Um, to kick us off, can you, can you tell us, in, introduce yourself, tell us about yourself, your background? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so thankful to be here. Excited to have this conversation. Love entrepreneurship. And then today we'll talk about social entrepreneurship, which some people may know about, some people may not, but we'll, we'll get into that. Um, but first off, uh, I am the CEO and, and co-founder of an organization called the National Institute for Social Impact. It used to be the Colorado Institute for Social Impact, and we recently changed it. So started, founded here in Colorado Springs, and we're all about creating uh, businesses that have purpose and profit. So all businesses are there to make money, but there is a, a new kind of growth strategy out there for businesses that want to incorporate a higher purpose into their business model. So how can you create more good in the world via some type of social impact that you get back or some type of environmental impact? Some people are doing both these days. And so again, what we do is we help people strategize ways to start one from scratch, or we help them figure out ways to incorporate it within an existing business models. To us, a business is a for-profit, non-profit, doesn't matter. But in this, this, in this new kind of age and this new, really it's a new sector of the economy that we're talking about here, businesses are becoming more mission focused and nonprofits and mission-based organizations are becoming more business focused. So we kind of are in this fourth sector, this new space where it's a hybrid. So we take the best of both of these worlds, use it to build into some pretty cool uh, strategies to really create and solve social and environmental problems in our communities. That's what it's all about. Love it. Can you kind of give us your trajectory of how you ended up here? Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. And so I'll start off, you know, again, I'm a social entrepreneur, love business, love business to have a higher purpose or serve some type of cause. But my background is it's psychology. So I'll just be honest, with everybody. So <laughs> that's where I started out. So I'm a psychologist by trade. I have a master's degree in counseling psychology, worked 15 years uh, for a large behavioral health care company. Um, did therapy, uh, supervised therapists, um, did a lot of that uh, that work. And, and it really what happened, and, and it's one of those things where people ask me, like, did you find it or did it find you? It's like, it, it found me. And so when I was working for this behavioral health care organization, and I was doing, I was a supervisor for two departments. One, I help people find housing. And the second one is I help people find jobs. And what I learned pretty quickly is that when you find somebody a job that has a major mental health issue, they get better quicker and they stay better longer when they have work. And the paycheck's nice, don't get me wrong. We all need that to live, but I'm gonna be really honest with folks. It, it's about the purpose. It's about having a higher purpose. It's about society recognizing that you have a skill set that they'll pay you for. And there's research out there that supports this that people can feel the same way about a job or about volunteering. So again, it's about that higher purpose and having the ability to contribute back to society. 
but figured out pretty quickly that people got better uh, quicker when we got them a job. And so what we figured out was, you know, I can go into the community, I can ask people in the community to employ the folks I was working with. And again, it's pretty hard getting somebody a job that's suffering from a major mental health issue. So these are people that we were working with that had schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, major depression, anxiety. And so every once in a while you come across a nice soul uh, or somebody who had experienced these mental health issues and it would hire these people. Uh, but what we figured out really quickly was we can do that all day long and, and just really work hard. Or what if we started our own business? What if we started our own company and that company's purpose was to hire these people with a major mental health issue to come work for us? So we did. So the, the behavioral health care company, again, this is a behavioral health care company. We had a construction company, a custodial company. We had our own cafe. We grew our own food in a geodesic dome. Uh, we did art therapy, career services. We ran about 11 different social impact businesses, all in the trades and, and other areas where we could get people a job, give them job skills. They'd get something on their resume. Then they'd go back out into the community and get that next job. So we were kind of the ones willing to take that first chance for them. And then they had something on their resume. They had skill set. They had confidence. They had hope. And then through that, they were able, able to go and get other jobs. And so at this point in time, had no idea that this was a thing, had no idea what it was called. We just kind of walked around town telling everybody, we're a really weird nonprofit. And they said, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, we make money so that we can fulfill our mission of getting people jobs. And people were super, super confused. <laughs> and so eventually we, we learned the terminology, which was, oh, we're a social enterprise. It's like, oh, okay, this is a thing. This is a field. This is an industry. This is a new sector of the economy. And so that was kind of my initial journey into it. And then later on, as I transitioned out of the healthcare world, uh, fortunately before the pandemic, because let me just tell you, that would have been a whole other story <laughs> that we wouldn't have time for. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I found another job at the, the Better Business Bureau, Southern Colorado. So I'm the CEO there. And it was about six months into the job. I started getting phone calls from the community asking questions about, hey, I want to start one of these social impact businesses. Jonathan, you ran a bunch for 15 years. Now I want to do one. And I'm thinking to myself, and they said, can we meet? Can we go get a cup of coffee? And I'm like, sure, let's get a cup of coffee. There's probably five people. It'll take an hour apiece. I'll knock this out pretty soon. Yeah. Literally 500 people later, it was like, uh, we got to start a company. We got to start another organization that helps people figure out how to do this because you can't go Google the stuff on the internet. You can't watch a YouTube video. Um, it's harder than you think. There's a lot of great stuff out there about the theory and about the why in terms of why this is important and why this is cool, but very few things about how do you actually do it, build it, set it up, and more importantly, how in the heck do you market this stuff? So it absolutely found me. Absolutely love it. This is what I love to do, and there's a, a lot of opportunity out there for people that want to become a social entrepreneur. So, man, Jonathan, I absolutely love that. Love your story. Thank you so much for sharing that. And and so, okay, and you've been so you've been an entrepreneur for a long time. Also, I I would be really interested to know what percent of all the entrepreneurs you've you've worked with and the the people the employees that have transitioned to entrepreneurship how how many people would you say or what's the the ratio between between that that little phrase that you said did did the business find them or did they find the business absolutely you know and i think it really kind of comes down to it's probably usually something kind of found them um, you know, because how many times do you sit there and, you know, whether it's your parents or a friend or the guidance council, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And some people have a, have a purpose. I want to do this and I'm going to do it. But how rare is that? Usually when you talk to an entrepreneur, it's through some sequence of events, some chance encounter where they found their passion or they, they ended up in this opportunity or luck. It would have it that something like this happened. And, you know, I think that most of the people that I talk to, it, it is kind of one of those situations where, you know, and this is what I hear them tell me all the time. You know, I never thought I'd be doing this, but here's what I'm doing it, and here's why I'm doing it. And the people that know why they're doing it enjoy what they do. The people that don't, they think it sucks. And it's like, you know, you really shouldn't be doing this. And they're like, yeah, you're right, but I don't know what else to do. So, but the people who know why they do what they do, those are the ones that are happy. Those are the ones that enjoy it. And that makes all the difference in the world. That's right. It's the the Simon Sinek start with why exactly. concept, right? Super, super powerful. So based on the hundreds of entrepreneurs or, or, or people that you've helped become entrepreneurs in the social impact space, the social uh, entrepreneurship space, 
what have you found to be the biggest challenge or hurdle for those those wannabe entrepreneurs moving into the social entrepreneur space? That's a great question. I think there's a couple things that go with this. I think, and, and I'll talk about probably just three. The first one is really this whole notion of, all right, if I'm going to go and, and you know be an entrepreneur, make money through my business, and then I want to give back. You know, we're humans, and I don't care who you are. We've all got some kind of heart for something. We all have some other higher purpose. That could be a family. That could be veterans. That could be at-risk kids. It could be the environment. It could be whatever. So we, we we do resonate with something. But I think a lot of times people just believe that, you know, giving things away for free is easy. And there's a great quote out there as it relates to more of the social aspect of this is that it's easy to have a heart for the poor. It's way more difficult to have a mind for the poor. And so I think that's this notion of, you know, I'm just going to give, 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 give. And it's like, that's great. But if you give things away for free, as we've learned, you can actually create more dependency. You can create more problems. And the real big question is, are you solving the issue? And usually the answer is no. And here's an example. I've talked to a lot of people in my career that make a lot of money and they give a lot of money away. And I will tell you probably 80% of them answer the question this way. So I'll, I'll tell them, hey, you give away $500,000 every year. You give away a million dollars every year to charity. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for your giving. Why do you do this? And their first answer is, well, it's the right thing to do. This is how I was raised. I want to give back to my community. And giving feels good. And it, and it does. It feels wonderful. And my next question is, okay, does it work? And 80% of the time, it's, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea if this works. I haven't measured it. I, I ask questions, but I, I don't really get the answers that I want. But, you know, I'm always going to give no matter what. And it's like, that's awesome. That's great. But we've got to get more sophisticated in our methodology of how we give back to the community. It absolutely has to work, but it, more importantly, we got to measure it. So I think that's number one. It's like just giving just to give, you got to be more sophisticated with that. So again, having a heart for, for this stuff is easy. Having a mind for this is something totally different. I think that's the first part. I think the second thing for this, for, for entrepreneurs and, and social entrepreneurs is this. In the United States, for the last 300, 400 years, depending on how you do your nonprofit history, um, we have been told that if you want to do good, go work for a nonprofit. If you want to make money, go work for a for-profit. And that's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, and so here's what I mean by that. And really what we've been taught and told is that, you know, this is a way of life. This is the way you do it. And what I'm telling people is that it's not a way of life. And, and there are, there are you know, there's gap accounting rules that go with both. I'm talking about the unspoken rules that go with it. I'm talking about if you want to actually solve a problem, well, you're going to go work for a nonprofit. Well, nonprofits are underfunded. They don't have the resources to solve those problems, and yet they're expected to do this. Oh, by the way, if you have a CEO that can solve that problem, but they make too much money, let's run them out of town with pitchforks and, and torches, and they'll never get to the problem. Meanwhile, if you're selling violent video games to kids and you're making a lot of money, that's just fine because you're doing what you're supposed to do, which is, which is make money, even though that is actually causing some harm or some issues. And so we kind of got our wires crossed here. And so what I'm getting at is this. Being a for-profit or nonprofit is make the business work for you. You should not work for it. Those are tax statuses, nothing more. Follow the rules, don't break the law, but those are tax statuses. They are not a philosophical way of doing everything. So if you're in a for-profit business and you wanna do good and provide some type of impact in your community, do that in your business. If you're a nonprofit and you want to be more sustainable and have something that is going to generate income so you can sustain your mission, then sell a product or service. But we've kind of done this, it's either or. And what I'm here today to tell people is that that's a bunch of nonsense. There's an and, you can do both. There's a, there's three ways to do this. And this is where people kind of go, wait, you can you can do that? So yes, you can do that. You don't have to do the for-profit or, or the nonprofit. You can pick the third option, which is I wanna do a little bit of both. And so I think that's the, the second thing is that we've kind of been given this, this weird bunch of information that we've never really challenged in the past. Well, why has it been this way? Or why do we do it? That? Well, just because. And, and again, I'm not talking about legal stuff. I'm talking about these, these weird unspoken rules. There's a whole bunch of them to kind of get into, which we won't do today. But you got to think different about how to use those statuses to do what you want to accomplish. Make money by, by all means. But if you want to make money and do good, you can do that and you don't have to start a foundation. As a matter of fact, I tell people don't start a foundation. If you're an entrepreneur, you have no business starting a foundation because foundations are, that's a whole other animal. 
And that kind of gets into the third piece of this, of what is kind of difficult for this. And this is on more of the nonprofit side. Nonprofits look at businesses and they are uh, absolutely envious of everybody out there making money. Nonprofits are trying to find money. They're scraping hard for cash. Um, it's going to get a little bit funkier now with the way the economy is going and they're having a hard time surviving. And so nonprofits kind of look at businesses and they see businesses all around them for the most part that are successful. And they think, well, everybody out there is making money. Well, I can make money too. I'm going to start a business. And for all the entrepreneurs who are listening, uh, we all know this, that what is it? The failure rate is like, you know, one out of 10 is successful. So nine out of 10 fail. And it takes a while. It takes a couple, you know, to kind of get success. And nonprofit leaders typically don't know that, or understand that. They just see the successful businesses there that are making money. And they think, well, that's, that's easy. I can do that. So that's that third piece is that if you're a for-profit person, you think the mission stuff is easy. It's not. If you're a nonprofit person, you think the business stuff is easy. It's not. It's hard. So that's the third piece of just, if you want to combine purpose and profit together, it's awesome when it works well. It is extremely difficult to do. Running a business is hard. Running a nonprofit is hard. You can combine these two now. It's awesome. It's awesome when it works, but it is very, very hard to find the right balance between those two worlds. Awesome points. Love those three points. Now, so again, I'm assuming that your organization helps address and tackle those three points with folks that want to do be in the social entrepreneur space. Absolutely. That's what we specialize in. So I got a team of folks that have worked for me for, for a decade in some cases and all told, you know, I tell you this is that if you're a social entrepreneur and you've got three years to your name, you're a veteran. Um, I've been doing this almost 20 years, which is kind of weird when I think about that. And so I don't know what that makes me, maybe I'm ancient. I don't know, but you know, I've made million dollars worth of mistakes don't make the same mistakes. Let me help you get through the stuff. Some of it is absolutely, you know, just as you think it would be in terms of how you'd run a small business or uh, a large corporation. Some of it is counterintuitive. Um, and so at the end of the day, it really is about making sure people understand what type of accounting metrics you want, what type of uh, strategic planning you need, set up your business plan a certain way. How do you track the data? How do you make sure you have uh, really a triple bottom line philosophy in everything you do? And that comes with the leadership, the hiring, the marketing is a huge one. Telling your story is really important. There's a lot of pieces to this. And so we help people really make sure that they can make sense out of this, but also make sure that they're tracking the right metrics and hiring the right people. That's important. Yep. Excellent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now I want to ask a little bit more of a personal question. What has been the most challenging emotional lesson that you have learned in your growth as an entrepreneur? That's also a really, really great question. And, and I would tell you this, I learned early on, fortunately, I think typically when anybody, and again, these are people with wonderful intentions, right? So don't get me wrong, people have great intentions, but typically it's the individual, it's the entrepreneur, it's the social worker, it's the social entrepreneur that thinks they know best. I'm the expert, I have a degree or I've done whatever. And you know, I learned early on when I was working with um, severely mentally ill patients, um, you need to check in with them. These are the people I'm serving. So it's kind of like nothing about us without us is a phrase that we kind of use then. And so I learned pretty quickly early on that, um, you know, I'd go check in with them. I'd ask for their feedback. And it's like, who the heck am I? You know, this young kid out of, you know, get my master's degree out of grad school. And, you know, I, I know some things, but it's like, I know a whole lot of things that I, I'm more aware of the stuff I, I don't know <laughs> than the stuff that I do. So I would check in with them and they taught me a lot. And so here's a couple of things they taught me. And this is, this has paved the way for a lot of stuff that I do now. Number one, if you're going to treat people like criminals, they're going to act that way. If you treat people like they're disabled, they're going to act that way. If you treat people like people and you focus on their strengths, they're going to rise to the occasion. So I learned that early, early on. I also went and, and, and I asked him a question one day. It's like, we're doing all these great things, right? We're, we're doing construction and custodial work. And we, have a, we have a restaurant now. We're doing all of these things and we're doing so many things. Uh, what, what do we really do? Like, what's our, what's our focus? You know, and, and over here, we're, you know, the people with the degrees, right? We're trying to figure this all out. And so that nobody could figure this out. The marketing team couldn't figure it out. Like, what do you do? What's, your, what's, your, what's the reason that you exist? And I'm like, you know what? I don't know because there's too many things, but I know who I can ask. I'm going to go ask the people that I serve and I'm going to see what they think. And the marketing team is like, don't ask them. They're, they're patients of mental health. They're, you know, and I'm like, 
thanks, but let me go do my thing. Go away. <laughs> so I went and I asked him and I said, you know, hey, hey, folks, like I need your help on this one. Like, how do we describe it? Like, what do we do? What is it that we do? What is it the, the mission? I mean, it's our mission to give jobs to people um, that have mental health issues. I get that part. But what's what's that the core of what we do? Like, we can't figure this thing out. And all the all the people that were there that day looked at me and was they were like, you, you can't figure this out, smart guy. Uh, you, you got the fancy degree and you don't know what you do. And I'm like, yeah, but that's why I'm coming to you because you're you know you receive these services and we we work together. And they said, John, that's easy. We know what business you're in, even if you don't know what business you are in. We get you're in the business of custodial, in the business of construction, in the business of landscaping, and all these business. We get all that. But what you're asking is, how do you tie them all together? And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm asking. Like, what, what, what business are we in? And they said, Jonathan, you're in the business of hope. That's what you do. That's why we're here. And that's why we listen to you, because you give us hope. The businesses give us hope. Jobs give us hope. And then when we work with other people that have that drink, that same Kool-Aid, we give hope to one another. And, you know, I was like, oh, man, that's exactly what it is. And it's like, I capture that, put that in a bottle. And, and we and we figured out how to market that program. And it made all the difference for us. So I think that's the that that lesson will always stay with me. Like I still I remember the room. I remember the the moment I still get the chills when, you know, when they told me that it was like, oh, my God, that's exactly what it is. So you got to listen. You know, you got to pay attention. But more specifically, if you want to solve social problems and tough social issues and you want to help people. Be sure to ask them what they want and be sure to check in with them. That will always stick around with me. And they're way smarter than I am because they're, they're, they're living with it every day. Love it. Ego and pride get in the way of learning. Yes. And humility paves the way for education. And just it just sounds like your humility opened the door for you to be open to the, the right proper messaging that your customers after you asked them gave you willingly and and excitedly like oh dude you're in the business of hope like it i mean just how powerful you know that's that's that's, that's so powerful man john thank you for sharing that how important is mental and emotional health for social entrepreneurs i love this question and you know especially right now right it's 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 more important than ever um, for any single entrepreneur, or social entrepreneur, I mean, it is absolutely critical that you 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 take care of yourself. Number one. Number two, you got to know yourself, right? And if you don't know yourself, uh, you better figure it out. And again, when you just when you think you figured yourself out, you're going to keep learning. You know, you, you got to be a lifelong learner. I think that's what comes down to this a lot. But as an entrepreneur in general, um, <laughs> this is hard work. Uh, it's extremely hard work. You're you're working twenty four seven. Uh, your, your work. I love how people tell me, like, I want to work for myself. I just want to do my own thing. And I'm like, yeah, you work for everybody now. And some days you're the accountant, some days you're the janitor, some days you're the CEO and the founder. It just depends. And so knowing that you got to kind of carry, you know, this heavy load and knowing that you got to be kind of like an expert in everything, right? You really got to make sure that you are 100% aware of what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, what you're good at, what you're not, get help for the things you're not learn how to be better. But, you know, it really is making sure that you have a pretty good understanding of what your what your mental health is. Um, and right now, when people are tired and burned out and we're not done yet, you really got to make sure you're taking care of yourself. I, I, I just wrote an article in uh, our business journal that talked about this, where now is the time to kind of do like a leadership check-in, right? Go online, take something for free um, if you need to, but just kind of do a quick check to see, has your style changed? Are you the same? Um, do you have burnout? Do you have fatigue? Um, you know, ask for help if you do. Um, are you depressed? You know, do you have anxiety? I mean, these are things that we don't like to talk about. Um, our society is getting a little bit better. Um, not much, but it's a little bit better. So, you know, I'll, I'll take it. But we got to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves. Because guess what? If we don't, and if we send the wrong message to the people that work for us, they are going to fail. And if your staff fails, you're not going to make any money. And guess what? Here's what the research tells us is that people that are happy and people that are not burdened by mental health issues are way more productive. So you want to increase your productivity in your office, make sure your people are mentally healthy. You want to attract and retain top people to come work for you and stay working for you. You better have a good healthy culture where people are mentally well. These things are all interrelated. And so I always tell people, 
in business, I really wish uh, from a business perspective, more psychology was taught. And in psychology, I wished I learned more about business. Love it. Yes, 100%. I just had a conversation with a local CEO here in Colorado Springs, and she had shared Noble, man, it is, I've been a, she's like, I've been a CEO for a couple of years now. I've been in the, in the public health space for, for, for a number, for my whole career, but a CEO for my, this last couple of years. And she said, man, it is, you know, this isn't exactly her words, but it's lonely at the top. You know, she yeah. said, I had a colleague, a fellow CEO tell me, Hey, like be ready, strap in for this CEO job because it's, it's no joke. And she's like, no, I got this. It's not, you know, I got this. And she's like, man, it, he was right. Like it is no joke. And she's yep. like, you know, I'm so, I'm so focused on trying to take care of my employees, but I'm not, I, I'm not trying to take care of myself as much as I probably could and should be. And, and that's what happens a lot of times with leadership and entrepreneurship. It's the same thing. We're so, yep. we're so focused on the purpose, right? That higher purpose, which it's so easy to commit to that higher purpose that we lose ourselves in the process. So I, I, right. I absolutely love, love what you shared there. How do you take care of yourself, John? No, and, and that's the million dollar question there for all of us. You know, how do you take care of yourself? Because if you, if you weren't before, you're about, you're going to, you're going to pass out. This is, a, <laughs> this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? And, you know, for people that have done a pretty good job taking care of themselves, you know, then it's a, still a matter of, okay, now what else are you doing? And so for me, it's a couple things. Uh, number one, here's my here's my belief, and in, and in, in there's a, an article out there too that I wrote that talks about this. Where there's this whole notion of work life balance, right? And everybody struggles and they freak out about it. And it's like, you know, here's my my take on that. There's no such thing as work life balance. So stop stressing yourself out. Like just kind of put that out of your mind, wipe it away. It's all about work life integration. When you try to find balance between work and your home life, you're never going to find it. There's always something coming up. But it's and it's a simple psychological thing, right? When you when you talk about work-life integration, you have the control, you have the choice. So if I am going to let a little bit of uh, home into work because I got to take the kids somewhere or do something for there, it's my decision. If I'm at home and I got to do a little bit of work to make sure that I'm getting something done, so that I can focus on on my family and, and, and I just need five minutes, eight, ten minutes, whatever, it, it's your decision. So really, what it comes down to is like, how can you be strategic? about incorporating both of those schedules into it. So it's no longer about an eight to five and that's out the window. The work world is changing, it's changed already, it's changing even more, specifically with working from home and hybrid stuff. So it's about figuring out your strategy and being selective and strategic about how you integrate both of those aspects into it. You will never achieve balance and that's okay. Some weeks you're gonna have 80% work. Some weeks it's gonna be 80% family. It's gonna fluctuate. Give yourself some grace, allow yourself to have the flexibility and, but you got to be strategic. You got to think it through. So for me, when I had that, like, oh my God, this is, I, I have the control about this and it's never going to be balanced perfectly. There's no such thing. It's about the integration that I choose to have or not have it has saved me all kinds of, of stress, hundred percent of the time. The second thing that I do is um, I, if you don't have a mentor, if you don't, they can, this can be a therapist too. I mean, it absolutely could be that. Uh, it could be a family member. It could be somebody, you, you got to have somebody that is objective enough though, that's the trick, uh, to be able to, uh, hey, I need some advice. Or, hey, I think I'm I'm screwing something up. And if it's gonna be your best friend, it's gonna, I got your back. You, you need a best friend to rah-rah you, don't get me wrong. But you also need that person to say, you know what, you are making a mess of this. And this is what I've observed and I got your back. I, I you know, I'm here to support and help you. But yeah, you, you need to think about this a little bit different. So you need that person in your corner. And again, it should, a mentor, if you got, if you can get one, they're, they're worth their, their weight in gold. No question about it. Uh, mentors come and go out of our lives. When you got one, hang on to them. They're rare. Really good ones are rare. But, you know, there's a lot of great people in the business community that are super smart, willing to help, and they'll help you out. So find one. And then the other thing for me that I've, I found, too, is I'm like most entrepreneurs, I think, you know, we, we love to work. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of times that's part of who we are. It's our purpose. It's our purpose to build. It's our purpose to create. It's our purpose to problem solve. And that, that charges us up, right? But if you don't know yourself well enough to know when, you know, anybody, everybody can get tired of doing this stuff at some point, you're going to fall flat in your face. So you're going to know when to say when. And so you got to take time just to go away. Um, most of the time for specifically Americans, it's about, you know, what, two weeks a year, you take vacation and that's kind of the way we do it. And the rest of the world does it the opposite way. 
Um, you know, it's like we got to take a, a lesson from our friends over in Europe. You know, those folks don't live to work, right? They work to live, and that's a big difference. So my mentor told me the other day, when are you going? As I went on vacation, and I got back from vacation, and she says, when are you going again? And I said, I'm not going to go for a while. She's like, you need to go once a quarter. In these weird times, go more frequently. And I'm like, seriously? And she's like, yeah. And it was in about like a, a three weeks after I got back from my vacation. I'm like, I'm freaking tired. And she's like, take a vacation. So I went for a long weekend and I'm like, all right, I'm back. I'm good again. You know, but it is one of those things that just, and it maybe it's, you know, a long weekend. Maybe it is a big vacation once. Or, I don't know what it is. And again, it, it sounds counterintuitive because a lot of times people are so busy or they don't have a workforce right now. So they can't take time off. Whatever it looks like for you, it's got, you got to do self-care. You got to make sure that you're paying attention to this stuff. So, you know, for me, that's the other thing that I'm going to do a lot of. Love it. Yes, that's great. Excellent points. Excellent points, which all requires, you know, from the EQ standpoint, it requires self-awareness. For me, I know in the early, probably the first 10 or 15 years of me being in business for myself, I, I was not even aware enough when both me and my wife were approaching burnout. I wasn't even aware. We were so, so consumed with the higher purpose and the bigger goal that, that we, we literally ran ourselves into the ground, not even, not yep. even being aware of it. Right. So I love that. Great, great advice. Great wisdom. Okay. Any final comments, John, that you want to share about what, what you do or what your, your organization does or any final advice or thoughts that you'd want to share to either budding entrepreneurs or new entrepreneurs? Yeah, I, I think this is the most important message I can tell people today is that is this, is that capitalism is evolving. Business is changing. And everybody, whether this is your thing to do the social impact hybrid thing or not, you got to pay attention to it. And, and I'll give you a quick statistic. Um, this is new stuff. This year it happened for the first time ever since we've been recording this. The number one consumer in the United States has always been the value-driven consumer. I want the best quality product for the best price. Everybody gets that. Um, They're now number two. This is as of this year in February. Uh, so this comes from the IBM uh, Institute that does research on, on all these business types. And the number one consumer, oh, by the way, not just the United States, but now the world is a purpose-driven consumer. C conscious consumerism is on the rise um, people want to work for and buy from a company that's doing good. I can go buy from any company that just made there to make money. That They're easy to find. They're everywhere. But as a consumer, I'm going to do a little bit of extra research and find a company that's going to sell a product that I want and I need, but they're going to do just a little bit of extra things of good. So my money is going to go further. Oh, by the way, guess what? 70% of Americans say they pay more for a product or service if it has some kind of social impact mission to it. And so... I just urge everybody to just at least pay attention to this, right? It's hard to do, but, you know, I believe, and at the Institute, we believe this too. We believe this is the future of business. We believe that purpose-driven business is the future of how capitalism is going to work. Uh, and, and guess what? Anybody out there who's a millennial that's been working at companies and corporations and is now starting their own business, the vast majority of millennials that are starting businesses now are doing it with some kind of social impact stuff plugged in. They might be using the language. They may not be. Either way, they're starting their own companies, they're starting their own businesses, and they're doing something that has a higher purpose because they want to leave a legacy. They want to fix the problems that are out there. They also want to make money. You can do both. It's an and situation now. It's no longer an either or. Amazing, John. So how do we how do we find you or follow you? What are your, your websites? How do we find and get access to your resources? Absolutely. So, you know, absolutely check our website out. Um, we're the National Institute for Social Impact. Our web address is www. It's ni the number four. That's for fourth sector. This is the fourth sector of the economy. So, ni4si.org, and folks can absolutely email us as well. Um, the easiest email is just info at so i n f o info at ni4si.org. Um, you can, you can message us there. You can check out, we have classes, we have training, we have free stuff, we have paid stuff. We have, we just want to get the information out there and really be a support for social entrepreneurs that are trying to make a difference in the world. Excellent, John. Thank you so much for your time and wisdom. And I'll be sure for the, the, the folks that are watching on YouTube or, or listening to the podcast platforms out there, I'll include all that, 
the websites and, and how to get a hold of John in the show notes so you guys can get get access for the information from uh, from John and his organization. John, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. And thank you for for how you are helped champion such a, a powerful and impactful and, in my opinion, necessary space that is doing such a great thing in our not only our local community, but our global community as well. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate that. Thanks for what you're doing as well.